seats. The meeting will come to order. My name is Brian Walsh, and I'm proud to be your town moderator, and welcome to this year's town meeting. Will the membership please stand, and this is the important part, remain standing until I request you to take a seat. We have with us tonight student members of the Milton High School uh, Chorus who will be singing uh, our national anthem. Let me introduce them to you. We have Chris Fort, Garrett Sager, Liz O'Connor, Jacqueline Rasuto, Harry Kong, Monica Komaka, and I think that's everyone. Also, in keeping with our tradition, we'll start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. So please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The meeting will now open with an invocation by Rabbi Fred Benjamin, the religious leader of Congregation Beth Shalom of the Blue Hills. I very much appreciate Rabbi Benjamin taking some time from his busy schedule to join us. Rabbi Benjamin just last week was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America located in New York City. He is also busy keeping up uh, during this exciting time of construction which will begin pretty soon, this month perhaps of the, uh, their new synagogue building on Chilman Way, uh, Rabbi Benjamin. Far too often, there is a misconception about what it really means to be religious. There's a Jewish saying that sometimes the best way to be religious is to be an atheist. How so? When a person comes to your door asking for food, the answer can never be, God will provide. In the Torah, the five books of Moses, there are three commands to love, only three. The first one to appear is the one where we find the statement to love your neighbor as yourself. Now let's be honest, it's a command for a reason. It's not always so easy to do. The second love command is to love the stranger as yourself. Whether you are the new kid in school or a newbie to town, no one likes feeling different or unaccepted. It is therefore the obligation for those who already have friends, for those who already know the ins and outs of things, to take the first step by reaching out to the stranger to make that person feel welcome and included. Last on the list, dead last, is the command or mitzvah to love the Lord with all your heart, might, and soul. The message here is that true love or devotion to God 
cannot be achieved unless it is preceded by a show of care and concern for your neighbors and the strangers in your midst. This is the opportunity that is the challenge of being a town meeting member. That every vote on every issue be made not out of self-interest, but rather with the goal to provide for and increase the common good for neighbors and strangers alike. Rabono Shal Olam, Master of the Universe. I pray that the members of this body know that showing love to others first and foremost is exactly what you hope for and that doing so makes you very happy indeed to be last on the list. Amen. I promised the rabbi that I would ask you all to turn your cell phones off uh, before I introduced them. Would you please turn your cell phones off or your ringers now? And we're so happy none of them rang. Thank you for remaining standing. Since our last meeting, we've lost four men, including several very long serving town meeting members and others. So please allow me to share some observations and then please join me in a moment of silence for Dr. J. William Dolan, a former member of the Milton Planning Board for more than 32 years and a town meeting member for 48 years. Paul I. Kelly, very active with the Milton Council on Aging, serving on their board for more than 18 years. He was also a town meeting member. And two individuals who, during a very scary time in the world, enlisted together on the same day to serve in the U.S. Marine Corps in World War II. The first Marine, John D. McBarish III, was a town meeting member for 34 years. As a Marine, John rose to the rank of Staff Sergeant and participated in the Battle of Iwo Jima and the occupation of Japan. John instilled the notion of public service in his family. His daughter Kathleen Otina served many years as a town meeting member and on Milton School Committee. We lost another former Marine, John's very close friend, M. Joseph Manning. Joe also served his country as a Marine in World War II and subsequently as a state representative from 1966 to 1996 for the 7th Norfolk District in Milton and Randolph. Joe also served on Milton's Park Commission for nine years and the Board of Assessors for 57 years before stepping down last year. As if that wasn't an impressive record of service, and by any measure it was, Joe also served as a town meeting member for 68 years from 1947 <clears throat> until he passed away on April 14th. He was the longest serving town meeting member in Milton and I believe anywhere in the state. His resounding voice and measured words will be missed at this meeting. Again, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Now, will all the town meeting members please remain standing and order the town clerk may give them your, the oath of the office. And then please, one last time, remain standing after she's finished. If you'd repeat after me and raise your right hand. I state your name. Hereby swear and affirm that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member to uphold the general laws of the Commonwealth, the bylaws of Milton in the Constitution of the United States of America? So help me God. Thank you. 
And now, would the uh, new town meeting members elected this year remain standing? And everyone else, please have a seat. The town meeting, please join me in welcoming our new members. Thank you. You may be seated. Having been advised by the town clerk that a majority of town meeting members are here in attendance, I hereby declare that a quorum is present for the transaction of business. Before proceeding with the business of the meeting, however, there are certain preliminary matters to be taken up. First, permission has been requested for certain members and personnel of the school committee, planning board, board of health, and other boards, committees, and departments who are not town meeting members to sit on the floor with other members of their respective boards, committees, and departments upon understanding, of course, that they will not vote. Hearing no objection from the body, such permission is and hereby will be accorded. Second, permission is granted to Milton Cablevision to televise these proceedings. Also, please note there are two side aisle microphones, each with three seats in front reserved for those waiting to be recognized to speak. Third, I will now briefly, particularly for the benefit of the new town meeting members, review some of the procedural rules for the conduct of this meeting, which, unless there is an objection, will be the rules for the conduct of this meeting. First, town meeting members are required to check in with the town clerk and be seated in the lower part of the auditorium, which is demarcated and reserved for town meeting members. Town citizens and others who are not town meeting members are required to be seated in the upper part of the auditorium. Second, any town meeting member wishing to speak to any article or pending related matter will first go to the nearest microphone and upon being recognized by the moderator will identify herself or himself by giving her or his name in precinct. If you have not been recognized by the moderator, you are not permitted to speak to the meeting. On occasion, members will informally alert the moderator that they desire to be recognized to speak on a certain article. While your moderator will attempt to remember those who desire to be recognized in any article, please be advised that the only way to assure that you can be recognized is to go to a microphone and wait to be recognized. Third, by longstanding tradition, while any other registered voter of the town who is not a town meeting member may not vote here at the town meeting, he or she may be recognized to address the town meeting, provided that the voter in advance of the particular session has obtained permission from the moderator. Uh, we have some that have requested to speak to you at this meeting. Fourth, any person having a monetary or equitable interest in, or who is employed as an attorney or otherwise by another person interested in, any matter under discussion shall disclose the fact of his or her interest in the, our employment before speaking thereon. <clears throat> Fifth, with reference to each article in the warrant, the recommendation of the warrant committee shall ordinarily be considered to have been presented in the form of a motion by the chairperson, which has been seconded by the secretary or other member of the warrant committee who is a town meeting member, unless otherwise expressly states at the time the question to be voted on under each article will usually be whether or not to accept the recommendation of the warrant committee. In other words, generally the recommendation of the Warren Committee is the main motion pending under the article. In the event that the Warren Committee recommends a no vote on the article, the question will be presented as a vote on a motion made and seconded to approve the article, i.e., members will vote yes if they favor the article and no if they oppose the article as recommended by the Warren Committee. Sixth, pursuant to Section 4, Chapter 2 of the Town Bylaws, the moderator requires that any substantive our complex motions be reduced to writing and presented to the moderator before submission to the meeting. We do have forms that have been prepared by the town clerk, so if anyone needs to uh, write one down, we have forms. I have some, the town clerk has them. Seventh, by longstanding tradition, town meeting time, a handbook of parliamentary law, third edition, will be, in addition to the bylaws of the town of Milton and the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, be the rules of order for this meeting. Eighth, any member desiring to show slides, make a PowerPoint presentation, or any other visual material before a meeting must make the appropriate arrangements and inform the moderator. Nine, members are urged to obtain all information needed by them prior to the meeting. However, by tradition, the moderator will recognize any town meeting member for the purpose of requesting additional information relevant to the matter under consideration. All such requests must be directed solely to the moderator, who will attempt to ascertain the most appropriate official who should answer such an inquiry. Answers will not be provided while the member still has the floor in order to prevent the temptation 
to cross-examine the person providing the information, which is not permitted. However, the moderator will separately recognize a member once for the purpose of posing a follow-up question. Sometimes the information is not available or is not immediately available, and the request for information will simply not be fulfilled. Tenth, when it is announced by the moderator that the meeting will proceed to a vote, debate will be closed and the pending question will be put to the meeting. Eleven, upon a question being put to the town meeting, the moderator will first determine by voice vote the sense of the meeting. If the moderator is unable to dis decide by the sound of the votes, of the voices, or if his announcement of the vote is doubted by seven town meeting members standing in their place, the moderator shall then proceed to have a standing vote on the question. If the vote is further doubted by 25 town meeting members standing in their places, then there will be a roll call of the meeting with the town clerk calling the name of each town meeting member in alphabetical order and each town meeting member upon his or her name being called shall rise in place and answer yes or no. Twelve, no vote shall be reconsidered at the same meeting except upon a motion made within one hour of the adoption of such vote, unless by two-thirds vote provided that the time which is elapsed which elapses during any adjournment of the meeting shall be excluded. Thirteenth, because of the constraints of state law proposition two and a half, the budget articles as recommended by the Warren Committee to this town meeting are the maximum tax levy limitations permitted by state law pursuant to proposition two and a half. While the moderator will entertain motions to amend budget articles upward, the town's total appropriation may not exceed proposition two and a half the limit set by Prop 2 and a half, thus to avoid potential chaos and the necessity for additional meetings to balance the town's appropriation within the levy limit on the amount of revenue that the town may raise the property tax, your moderator both urges and expects that any member offering an upward amendment to a budget article will also, for the benefit of fellow town meeting members, specify an offsetting decrease in some other line item or specify what additional source of revenue are, uh, is or will be available. In addition, it is also permissible to make increased funding subjects to increased funding subject to an override ballot vote by the registered voters of the town. Fourteenth, each person speaking to an article or amendment is limited to ten minutes, and no person may speak on a question more than once when any other person desires to be heard, or more than twice on the same question, without the permission of the town moderator. Pre-approved presentations will not necessarily be limited to the ten minutes at the discretion of the moderator. Hearing no objections, this, these will be the procedural rules for the meeting. Certain matters coming before the town require a two-thirds vote. We have several at this meeting. In accordance with Chapter 448 of the Acts of 1996, I will entertain the following procedural motion, which allows the moderator to declare a two-thirds majority vote has occurred. The motion is, on matters requiring a two-thirds vote by statute, account need not be taken unless the vote so declared is immediately questioned by seven or more voters as provided in General Laws, Chapter 39, Section 15. Is that, that's been moved and seconded. Second, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The motion's unanimous. Some observations of this meeting. This year we will have several articles that will require a two-thirds vote, and I will inform you of those uh, before, before we vote on those motions. A quick, we're, we're about to proceed you'll, to Article 1, which you will find on page 27 in your warrant. As, as you turn to that, I'd like to point out something. We, uh, we had an interesting meeting last fall. You may recall that we, uh, on several occasions, there was discussions about, oh, it's a revised recommendation. There was a lengthy discussion on the grammatical impact of placement of an I in a comma. And in general, I found, and I know that some town meeting members addressed me, and I know they addressed the uh, town government study committee, that there was concern, what were they actually voting on, and was it clear? And uh, the town government study committee, as well as others, had recommended that what we try to do is to, every motion that you're voting on, we display in this wonderful large screen so there will be no confusion. So we have... Uh, through the help of, of several people, including uh, Mr. Hurley from the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Pavlicek from the School Committee, our town clerk and her office. We have the motions ready to display tonight. 
we hope to get, and we will not get there for this meeting, but we hope to get to a point where revisions that are happening real time we will also get displayed. And so that we'll become accustomed to this town meeting that what you're voting on, you will have, in fact, your warrant, and you'll have a written copy, but what you're voting on will also be clearly uh, projected on the screen. So I hope you'll find that helpful. So let's proceed to Article 1, which you'll find on page 27 on your warrant. Article 1 is to hear and act upon the report of the town accountant in other town offices and committees. And it is recommended the town vote to accept the report of the town accountant. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 2. To see if the town will vote to authorize the collector of taxes to use all means of collecting taxes which a town treasurer, when appointed collector, may use. And it is recommended the vote. The town vote yes. Anyone wish to speak to this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 3. To see if the town will vote to authorize the town treasurer to enter into compensating balance agreements during the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2015, in accordance with the provisions of General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53F, and to act on anything related thereto. And it is recommended the town vote yes. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 4, to see if the town will vote to authorize the moderator to appoint a committee of five citizens to consider such proceedings of the legislature and state boards and commissions as may affect the interests of the town and confer as they may think expedient with the selectmen in regard to the employment of counsel or represent the town in any such proceedings. The members of such committees to hold office until the final adjournment of the next annual town meeting and until the appointment of any succeeding committee authorized at such meeting. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 5. To see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for capital items to determine how said appropriation shall be raised, whether by borrowing or otherwise, and to act on anything related thereto. This is submitted by the Board of Selectmen in the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. And it is recommended that the town appropriate the sum of $1,473,000 to fund the capital projects listed below. We have a revised recommendation. Ah. Yes, yes. So I uh, apologize. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to recognize the chairman of our Warren Committee, and if I could, I'd ask him to read the recommendation and uh, when he's comfortable, but he also wants to use this article as the first budget article uh, to make some overall comments about the Warren's Committee's overall position on the budget before you. So, Mr. Hayes, you're recognized. Right. Yes, I do. When we get there. Well, welcome to summer. We survived. We're solvent. We can pay all our bills after you quickly vote to approval of the budgetary articles to follow. So, I'm Ted Hayes, I'm town, a town meeting member from Precinct 3 and chair of your warrant committee. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, honorable board of selectmen, uh, fellow warrant committee members, thank you, um, town meeting members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I will be as brief as possible as we now have 44 more articles to go in this year's warrant. Uh, this presentation is just a quick sketch of our situation financially, so please read the warrant for more detail. Uh, first, I would like to thank the town for passing the override ballot question uh, to provide a dedicated source of funding for our firefighters' ongoing medical expenses. This made the appropriate... This made the appropriation of 300000 under Article 13 unnecessary, and as you can see from the handout, the Warrant Committee has revised its recommendation for that article. Concurrently, we allotted portions of that 300000 to three different articles. The first of these, Article 5, restores $186,780 
in capital spending to fulfill the Capital Improvement Planning Committee's original request. The second, ar the second Article 31, adds 33,000 to the school department appropriation in an effort to avoid disrupting the elective offerings at the high school and the jobs of four teachers. Finally, the balance of $80,220 has been added to fiscal year 2016's reserve fund under Article 39. Uh, this is for two currently unspecified but potentially costly situations, residual property damage, both public and private, from snow and ice, and unknown costs attendant to the eventual demolition of the Hendry's building. This will happen sometime. Okay, most of the following slides illustrate some aspect uh, of our current status and, and look at some changes over time. And I'll post this to the town meeting page so you can look at it again if you really want. Um, so, this is uh, our total funds available for appropriation. It, the slide shows the change over last year's available funds. It's about 3.5%. Please note the increase in local receipts. Um, it's of $590,000 or about 10%. This increase was critical in allowing us to be here tonight not presenting a contingent budget. Uh, that'll be next year. Also, uh, we enjoyed an unprecedented spike in free cash to almost three million. Our use of it for operations may be controversial, but it's really not much out of line with how we have supplemented the tax levy the previous two years. Reserves and bond rating. Uh, the committee has struggled over many years to fund departments adequately while also trying to add money to the stabilization funds. This year we put our rainy day appropriation of about 594000 into the snow and ice budget instead. I think it was warranted. The current balances in the funds are not a sufficient buffer in the case of need after a disaster or during an economic downturn, nor are they sufficient to offset the amount needed in an override year. That would be next year. As previously noted, these balances need to be doubled or maybe tripled before contributions might be suspended. So we have a long way to go, um, and aside from a healthy contribution under Article 36 to the other post-employment benefits trust fund, we have missed a year. So apparently taxpayers want to hear how our tax assessment is developed. Our chief assessor has cautioned me that these numbers are subject to change, but this may be a close approximation. So the first step is to calculate the total amount to be raised from taxes, property taxes. So we take the total amount to be raised to pay for all expenditures, that's A, um, and then deduct all other sources of revenue, such as state aid and local receipts, to arrive at the tax levy. The assessors and selectmen determine the percentage split between residential business and other classes that comprise taxable property. Last year, the percentage for the residential class was 93.88%. Um, it may be similar this year. This means that of the 70.8 million to be raised, 66.5 million or so is to be raised from the residential tax rate. So we take the total residential valuation, that's F, and do some straightforward division to get to the tax rate per thousand dollars of residential assessed value. Lastly, we calculate the tax bill. In this example, we have the average assessed value for a single family home. That's currently 565,278. Um, and divide it by a thousand and multiply the result by the tax rate to get our estimated tax bill. 8,190 dollars. So where does that bill leave us? Pretty much where we were last year. Um, oh. In 
In terms of the single family tax bill, we ranked 39th in the state last year, up from 40th in 2013. The rankings for 2015 have not been published yet. Um, that's where we are in the state, but are we getting any help from the state? Well, here's our net state aid picture since 1981. Um, we are finally, finally, whoop, wait a minute. We're finally back to the pre-recession levels of 2009. So it's been a long, hard climb. Um, okay, annualized revenues. Looking at all our revenues, this slide uh, <coughs> brings us up to date. You can see, you can see the state aid. Well, the bottom two lines: state aid and and uh, local revenues have only grown by about 1% each, each year. Um, so at that rate, we, we, we are increasingly reliant on the property tax. Um, now, if you observe the black 5% trend line, sorry, this is my favorite kind of stuff talking into a microphone. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you z observe the, the black 5% trend line, you'll notice that the property tax line has held above it for the first 12 years of this chart. That's the blue line. The last three years, it's dipped below, and this widening disparity is, is, is a, a potential harbinger of uh, budgetary distress. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Anyway. Um, so very quickly, uh, here's revenue breakdown from 2001. And if you keep your eye on the big, the big wedge of pie, which is property tax, here we are. It's gone up to 77% of the budget. Um, This is the effect, uh, this, this slide illustrates the difference between those two pie charts. And you can see property taxes uh, are required um, at a greater percentage of the budget each year. Okay, expenses. Uh, I don't know if I need my notes anymore. Well. This slide shows what used to be two of the worst budget busters in the budget, uh, <clears throat> group insurance or health insurance and regular, in regular insurance. We have experienced a great amount of relief, as you can see those lines. As you can see, these, these have flattened out considerably in the last three years, which has allowed us um, to make ends meet without uh, going to the voters for an override. One of the elements. Um, the largest four budgets. Uh, the best line here is the uh, DPW line. Um, and you can see it heading off the chart this year. So we'll have to redesign this one. The reason for that is the, the shift in um, allocation of expenditures out of the solid waste line into the regular DPW, uh, there's for a new division of stormwater management, about $400,000 made the shift from solid waste to DPW. And next year, this will really go off the charts because we have to add $800,000 to meet federal mandates for uh, stormwater management. Uh, that, that will form the basis of an override. Okay, very quickly, departmental allocations. If you just keep your eye on the group insurance and retirement budgets over here. Um, this is 2001, here's 2016. 
you can see the problem our operations which are school fire police DPW um, are being squeezed out by uh, benefits so. hey all right so there we are the report of the warrant committee and your warrant outlines uh, in better detail the process and thinking behind our development of the budget for fiscal year 2016 um, I think the results are, are fair, but the structure is fairly fragile. The uh, process required too much improvisation, and I believe there is signs of stress in many of the budgets. I want to reiterate my belief that a successfully run town will pass an operational override in the appropriate year, that would be next year, rather than the year after dislocations to staff and disruptions of service have occurred. The budgets since the last override have generally been austere, and, and we have had good fortune in the moderation of many costs. But effective government and education require watchful funding to avoid an unnecessary decline unworthy of our town. After two years as chair, I continue to be impressed by the dedication and expertise of our town's employees and volunteer citizens. Their collective efforts shouldn't be jeopardized for lack of funding. Mr. Thank Moderator, on behalf of the Warren Committee, I want to thank all the department heads, the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, the Town Government Study Committee, and all the other boards and committees and their staff for participating in a thorough, cooperative, and I believe equitable budget process this year. As chair, I want to thank all the members of the Warrant Committee for bringing their diligence, intelligence, and humor to our duties. Lastly, the committee thanks all the citizens of our town who in one way or another presented their opinions to the committee for consideration and deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. So Mr. Hayes, now, now realizing you're not especially comfortable with that microphone, I'll actually read the re revised recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So by now, is it displayed on the screen? It's in the process of being displayed on the screen. Uh, one other thing that you will note, if you picked up the handout, it's printed in color, which is a uh, big advantage. You see the changes that were made to the original recommendation are made in red. That should allow you to understand that a little bit better. <clears throat> As it's displayed, let me read you the recommendation for Article Five, which is the main motion that you will be voting on. It is recommended the town appropriate the sum of $1,659,780 to fund the capital projects listed below. The fire department, buildings improvements and repairs, $145,000. Police department, prisoner transport van, $51,000. Schools, security camera upgrades, $68,000. Schools, virtualized servers, $32,500. The town virtual server environment upgrades, $13,800. The DPW, a bucket truck for $180,000. The DPW roadways for $400,000. The DPW catch basin cleaner for $80,000. The parks utility tractor for $30,000. The DPW cemetery reconstructed DPW locker rooms and cemetery garage for $200,000. In the subtotal recommended bonded capital items are $1,200,300. The town school finance software phase one, $160,000. The schools iPads and iPad carts, $186,780. The schools HVAC control upgrades, $38,000. The town computer hardware, $27,200. The library computer hardware, $25,000. Inspectional Services Vehicle, $22,500. The subtotal recommended non-bonded capital items of $459,480. The total recommended capital items, $1,659,780. And that to meet said appropriation, the sum of $1,659,780 be appropriated for the purpose of financing 
the rehabilitation, replacement, or enhancement of the town's facilities and public safety equipment, as described above, including costs incidental and related thereto, and that the Treasurer, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, is authorized to sell and issue bonds or notes of the town, aggregating not more than $1,200,300 in principal amount pursuant to the provisions of Chapter 44, Section 7 of the Massachusetts General Laws as amended, or any other applicable law that the Board of Selectmen be and hereby is authorized to accept and expend in addition to the foregoing appropriation one or more grants or gifts from any other public or private funding source in the sum of $459,480 be raised from the funds certified by the Department of Revenue as free cash. This will require a two-thirds vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recognition of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. I declare a two-thirds vote. The motion is passed. Article 6, to see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate the Board of Selectmen for the purpose of conducting a municipal audit for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2015, and further to see if the town will vote to authorize the committee appointed pursuant to Article 14 of the 1978 annual March Town Meeting, the Town Audit Committee, to make recommendations to the Selectmen relative to the employment of a certified public accountant for the foregoing purpose and to act on anything related thereto. It is recommended the town authorize the town audit committee to make recommendations to the Board of Selectmen relative to the appointment of a certified public accountant for the purposes of this article, and the town appropriate the amount shown in the following tabulation under the heading recommended. Audit Department, the general audit is recommended FY16 of $58,200. The GASB45 evaluation, it is recommended FY16 of $8,000. For a total audit, recommended FY16 amount of $66,000. $200, and that's a med meet set appropriation, the sum of $66,200 be raised from the tax levy. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? It's a majority vote. All those in favor of the recognition of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 7. Article 7. We are going to read only, I'm going to read to you only the uh, recommendation because it's substantially the same as the article is originally printed. So if you'll please turn uh, to page 30, this will be, require a majority vote. It is submitted by the Town Government Study Committee and it is recommended the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town by inserting chapter four, a new section as follows. The moderator shall establish and appoint a committee of five persons for staggered terms not to exceed three years to be known as the audit committee. A minimum of three persons who serve shall have experience in accounting, or auditing, or financial management. No appointee shall be an employee of the Town of Milton or a member of the Town of Milton government, governmental entity, with the exception of the Milton Town Meeting. The Audit Committee shall be assisted by the Town Administrator and or other Town employees as requested by the Audit Committee in its work. The Audit Committee shall annually develop a scope of audit services, including the review of internal controls, to be formed by an independent licensed public accounting firm. Said audit shall be conducted in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. The standards for financial audits contained in government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States. The Single Audit Act Amendments of 1996 and the provisions of OMB Circular A-133 and auditing standards issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The committee shall develop and administer the selection process and shall recommend to the Board of Selectmen the appointment of an independent licensed public accounting firm for the conduct of the annual audit of the town's financial statements. The audit committee after the Board of Selectmen has received the annual audit financial statements and management letter inclusive of the in internal controls review and findings shall review and discuss the results with the Board of Selectmen and other elected boards in town officials as appropriate. The Audit Committee shall report to the annual town meeting on the ongoing compliance with the management letter and internal control recommendations. The Audit Committee shall annually review the performance of the independent independence of the audit firm and report to the Board of Selectmen. And the Audit Committee shall conduct any audit, excuse me, the Audit Committee shall not conduct any audit, nor is it responsible for determining or certifying that the town's financial statements are complete accurate, fairly presented, or in accordance with GAAP, or applicable law, 
nor is the Audit Committee responsible for guaranteeing the independent registered public accounting firm's report or to assure compliance with laws or regulations in general. At this point, I'd recommend, uh, recognize uh, Rick Neely, a town meeting member and chairman of our town government study committee. Mr. Neely, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rick Neely, town meeting member, precinct three, and chairman of the town government study committee. This is the first of a series of six articles that you'll be considering over the next few nights. And this has come out of the studies that we've done over the past year and also was included in the report by the Department of Revenue that was conducted about over a year ago. And the key point here is that we are creating a bylaw committee. Currently, there is a, there's been a standing committee. The charge has been vague to the committee. This really details and articulates what the charge should be and it outlines a process for the committee to follow and we bring to you a town meeting a report on the compliance with the recommendations of the report so that you will have a complete understanding of what the audit firm has recommended and we think the audit committee that's outlined here as proposed will do a good job of developing the scope for the audit, reviewing it with the board of selectmen and the departments as needed and coming back to town meeting annually to report to you on what is needed, if anything, in town government. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, Jim Henderson, town meeting member, Precinct 5. I happen to also be a member of the Board of Assessors and also a practicing uh, CPA. I'd like to propose an amendment specifically as it addresses uh, sentence three, stating no appointee shall be an employee of the town of Milton or a member of the town of Milton governmental entity with the exception of the town, a Milton town meeting. Uh, I can understand that you would probably not want to have that because you want to maintain the independence and integrity of this committee, which, which is valid. But also we have members uh, who are part of, elected officials are part of the town, who have valuable insight into the processes in town as to the accounting flow, et cetera, the financial information. And I think their input would be invaluable. So to totally eliminate them from this process of being on the audit committee might not, in my opinion, uh, be very wise. I think what I would suggest is that no more than one uh, individual can be an elected official or, uh, or uh, an employee of the town. So, sir, if I could help you and help the meeting procedurally uh, to attain your goal, I believe you would say, uh, as, as the sentence begins, no appointee, you would change that to no more than one? No more than one, yes. So we're adding the, the phrase more than one directly after the first word that sentence of no. Yes. Okay. So uh, the, the meeting member has made a motion to amend. It's been made. Has that been seconded? It's been made and seconded. So right now, we are open to discuss the motion to amend only, and then we'll get back to the main motion, depending on the outcome of this. Mr. Neely, you wish to be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The committee in its deliberations uh, was careful to review in terms of the composition of the committee. And I'd point out as I put my glasses on that there is a sentence there that follows at the end of that paragraph that refers to the audit committee shall be assisted by the town administrator and or other town employees as requested by the audit committee in its work. We believe that covers the scope of what Mr. Henderson is requesting and that in fact we don't believe that the entities being audited should be a member of the audit committee, but certainly can be called upon to respond. Also, I'd point out that part of a good audit process results in an exit interview with every department that's reviewed if there's a finding or there's something that has to be discussed. So we're not talking about leaving out the input of the town departments. We're talking about them being able to provide assistance as outlined at that last sentence in the paragraph. We just don't think that the integrity or the independence of the committee is served by having a member of the body that's being audited on the same committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neely. Okay, does anyone else wish to speak to the motion to amend, to make this change in the recommendation? 
Seeing none, I will wait for the position of the Warren Committee on the motion to amend. While we're waiting in the Warren Committee, uh, after we take the vote on this motion and then take the vote on the main motion, we're going to uh, take a, a, not a recess, but we're going to pause in the, in the deliberation of articles to follow a long-standing tradition of this meeting to recognize and hear from members of our state and federal uh, government legislators. Uh, we have with us tonight, and who's is able to arrive and had asked permission uh, beforehand, uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch. And so after we deliberate this, this motion, we'll hear from uh, Congressman Lynch. And I'm doing my best to fill in the dead air here. The recommendation of the Warren Committee is on the home stretch. Mr. Hayes, you're recognized for the position of the Warren Committee and the motion to amend. Thank you. Um, the Warren Committee uh, does not support the amendment. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to take a vote on the motion to amend. The motion was to add the phrase, more than one, after the word no and before the word appointee, in that third sentence, so to change the character from having no one to no, not more than one. All those in favor of the motion to amend say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The motion is defeated. We are now back to the main motion, the original recommendation before you, uh, and, and should be on the screen. Does anyone wish to speak to the main motion? Seeing none, all the, oh, somebody's pointing, oh, Mr. Hurley, by all means, the chairman of our board of selectmen, you are recognized. And, Thank the gentleman sitting up here who called the thank, fire. Thank attention. you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Tom Hurley, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, Tom Meeting Member, Precinct 5. Uh, before I speak to this, if, if you just indulge me, I, I'd just like to uh, recognize and thank Dennis Cohane for his three years of service on the Board of Selectmen. Uh, the hard job he did. And to also welcome our new Selectman, David Burns. So uh, with respect to this article, uh, just one, one small change that uh, is, is really just more technical than anything else. Um, in the first paragraph on page 30 where it talks about uh, financial audits contained in government auditing standards, the very last sentence, an auditing standards issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is technically incorrect. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts does not issue auditing standards. They yeah. never have and they never will. Okay, so, so Mr. Hurley, strike I suspect, that. strike the, is that what you're recommending, we strike it? Strike and auditing standards issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Okay, so for the members, let me point to where we are. You're actually in the, in the paragraph at the top of page 31, Mr. Hurley, am I correct? Yes. The last, the very uh, last line in the that. recommendation, yes. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Hurley is making a motion to amend by striking and auditing standards issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a motion that's been made, has it been seconded? It's been made and seconded. Does anyone wish to speak to the motion? To I see Mr. Moorash coming forward. You're recognized. And Mr. Mo and Mr. Morash, as much as I appreciate your t c conducting some eye contact with me, I, I actually appreciate when the members actually address the body who have to vote, so. I don't believe this is working. Can we hear you? Feel free to come up the front. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Morash, Precinct 2. I just raised a question, um, and I've, I've had very good dealings with um, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, um, and we're only working closer, but how do we know that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will never issue auditing standards? I'd just like to know if, if that's true. Could you tell me the lottery number next week? Thank you. Mr. Hurley, I recognize you for the purpose of addressing Mr. Morass's question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the, um, the, the standard setting bodies um, for, for auditing standards is the uh, is the uh, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, 
Financial Accounting Standards Board and the Government Accounting Standards Board. Um, the federal government does write auditing standards, not accounting standards, uh, uh, with respect to government audits. Um, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will follow government auditing standards. That's, you know, they're just not a standard writing board. Mr. Hurley, it strikes me that maybe some of the new town meeting members or others might not be aware of your professional uh, certifications. Would you please share what your profession is? Uh, yeah, I'm a certified public accountant. Um, Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion to amend? Again, we're now back to a motion to amend to strike that line which says, in auditing standards issued by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Seeing none, I'm looking for the recommendation of the Warren Committee. So after that long, hard, cold, snowy winter, we finally had a day today that we deserved, didn't we? Nice, about 75 degrees, sunny, and you had to come to town meeting. Oh, well. Mr. Hayes, Chairman of the Warrant Committee, you're recognized. Thank you. The Warrant Committee supports the amendment proposed by Mr. Hurley. Okay, we have a motion to amend that's been made by Mr. Hurley, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen and a CPA. Um, it's been supported by the Warrant Committee. All those in favor of the motion to amend say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. So we are now back to the main motion, which is exactly what you had printed with that removed line from this previous motion. Does anyone wish to speak to the main motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Thank you. Now, as I, as I hinted, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you and uh, allow to share a few comments with us, uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch. Uh, Congressman Stephen Lynch was elected to the United States Congress in 2001 following the passing of Congressman John Joseph Moakley. In the 114th Congress, Congressman Lynch is a member of the Financial o Services Committee and the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, where he serves as ranking member on the Subcommittee on National Security. Lynch is also a member of the Subcommittee on Government Operations. Congressman Lynch is a co-founder of the Congressional Labor and Working Families Caucus, which was formed to protect workers' rights and educate members of Congress on issues that impact American families. Lynch continues to serve as co-chair of the Task Force on Anti-Terrorism, and proliferation financing a bipartisan congressional panel that monitors the status of national and international efforts to track and stop the flow of funds to terrorist groups and works to strengthen our national anti-terrorist finance strategy. He and his wife Margaret are raising their daughter Victoria in these crystal in their lifelong hometown of South Boston. It's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Lynch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I think the introduction is going to be longer than my remarks, uh, thankfully. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for your courtesy, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, Brian, for allowing me to speak. Normally on Monday nights I'm in Washington, D.C., but uh, they let us out. Uh, we're on parole this week, so uh, I have a wonderful opportunity to, to join you just briefly. Uh, I do want to offer my condolences. I, I, I know uh, I was at the wake and at the funeral mass for, for Joe Manning, but, but uh, Former Representative Joe Manning was just a wonderful, wonderful reflection uh, of the town of Milton. And uh, as someone who is not of this town, uh, you could not have had a better person uh, presenting the image of what the town of Milton is. And he just had enormous respect across the Commonwealth. And uh, during his time, I had the wonderful honor of serving with him in the state legislature. And uh, I just uh, wanted you to know that, uh, that Joe and his family in the town of Milton uh, are in our prayers uh, and, and ably followed by my friend Walter Timothy as well. So uh, I want to say that there's, there's a little bit of reason for optimism in, in Congress. This last five or six weeks, we've seen uh, several important bills actually 
uh, work their way through the legislative process. Uh, first of all, the Department of Homeland Security funding bill, which in the past has been a real, uh, a real fight. Uh, this time, as a result of working with Democrats and Republicans, uh, it was necessary to really form a coalition between Republicans and Democrats to get this bill passed. So it was, uh, it was as legislation should be. It went back and forth. Democrats had some amendments on the, the principal bill, but uh, at the end of the day, we got a good bill passed. Same thing with the Medicare Protection Act. Uh, there was some threats to uh, seniors uh, as well as health centers and the Children's Health Insurance Program after uh, you know, probably two weeks of negotiations between Democrats and Republicans, we were able to cobble together enough people to put that bill forward, and that's the way it should work. And then finally, uh, it's been a long time since we had a long-term uh, funding bill for Amtrak and uh, passenger rail, and uh, we were able to get a five-year program done there. Again, with it, it was a joint coalition between Democrats and Republicans. So I'm hoping now that we're going to the appropriations bills and the budget that uh, that we will be able to continue that, continue that uh, bipartisanship, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, we're also uh, considering two spending bills. Uh, currently, uh, this past week, we had the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs uh, uh, funding bill and the uh, Energy and Water bill. Uh, we, we had some differences and concerns of the level of funding and also some of the benefits that might be lost by some of our veterans. So. Uh, I had a vote against both of those bills for, for different reasons, but uh, the President has threatened to veto, at, veto both of those because of the cuts to veterans, and I think we'll see them again, and I think cooler heads will prevail uh, in the next iteration of that bill, at least I'm hopeful on that count. Uh, we also had a debate around the budget conference report. Uh, unfortunately, it, uh, it was it was not favorable for working families. It was not favorable for, uh, for seniors. And uh, it, it, was, it was favorable for people in the extremely high uh, income bracket, but, but that's not really why I'm there. And uh, it also cut Pell Grants for students that are struggling. So uh, that's another one that I think is gonna get vetoed, but when it comes back to the House, I think, again, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a better shot at uh, getting some of the priorities that, uh, that, that should be in that bill. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this is a, a major trade bill. It's, uh, there's two steps. One is a fast-track bill that, let me just back up. The, the trade bill is negotiated in secret. That's the way this works. And uh, members of Congress are not allowed to read the provisions of the bill. We are not allowed, if, if it's on a fast track basis, we are not allowed to amend the bill. We're only allowed to vote it up or down. And uh, this is a major piece of legislation. It's a major trade bill. Uh, the, it covers 11 countries that all border the Pacific. Uh, you have some very strong democratic countries that are involved like the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, but you also have some countries in that mix, like Peru, Chile, Vietnam, which is a communist country, whose labor standards and environmental standards are, are really suspect. And so it, uh, it requires me to read the bill because it, it has such broad implications here. And uh, they're trying to force me to vote on a bill that I haven't really had a chance to, to go through because it, it affects those 11 countries differently. So it, it, it really requires people to read and understand the bill and how it's gonna work. So right now I'm pledged to vote against Fast Track. And, uh, well, thank you. And, and also, you know, I'm hoping that the, the president will allow a more transparent process. I'm down there to, to represent you and I can't really do that if I don't know what's in the bill or how it's gonna, how it's gonna work upon passage. So uh, we're gonna have to continue to fight that. It also has a provision in it that allows foreign corporations to challenge U.S. law in this country. If a, if a, if a foreign corporation is selling even a food product into this country and it feels it is being unfairly treated because of the regulations, the food safety provisions that we have in this country, they can go in and challenge this, challenge our own food safety laws 
before a, a tribunal and seek to overturn or be compensated for the lack of profit that they get or their inability to trade or, or they could challenge the statute itself the, or the regulation itself. So it's, it's really, this is important stuff and we got to get it right. So uh, I know that Mr. Capuano and I are, are in lockstep on that and uh, we're, we're both voting against fast track and trying to make that a more uh, transparent process. Transportation funding, this is a continual fight and uh, we're, we're having difficulty again. Uh, for any governor in the state, including our own, uh, you need a five or a six year transportation bill so that you can, you can fund these, pro these major projects. Environmental studies alone on a major project take about a year. So you need like a, you know, it's usually two or three years into the process before you actually get a shovel in the ground. So we need a five or a six year transportation bill. And so far for the last six or seven years, we've been doing one year extensions. And as a result, our bridges and roads and infrastructure has been crumbling. And there's about a trillion dollars in, wor in work out there to, to rebuild our infrastructure in this country. And I know, look, I'm, I'm fully in favor of the minimum wage, but think of what we could do if we put a million dollars into rebuilding this country's infrastructure. There would be enough jobs for, for, the, for the next generation, and it would have much bigger impact than, in this country than, than just, just you know, boosting the minimum wage for service workers, even though that is worthwhile, I'm just thinking about what the impact could be for our, for our country and for future generations. Let's see, uh, the FAA. So I've been working with some of the folks in, in Milton about the flyover, okay? The, uh, what they've called the next gen uh, guidance system for Logan Airport. And it's uh, the way it works, I'm sure most of you are familiar, it's almost like a tractor beam and it goes right over Milton. And after it goes over Milton, your houses, it goes to Dorchester and then it goes right over my house in South Boston. So we have a community of interest here and uh, we are trying to get them to move that. And not only in Milton, but also I just came from uh, Hull Town Meeting and they've, they've got a tractor beam over that community as well, Situate, Cohasset, Hull, uh, Hingham, and so right now we've got a number of measures that we're trying to move with the FAA. They, they are not known for their cooperation. And uh, I know that uh, uh, well, Walter, Walter and I, Walter, uh, Representative Walter Timothy and I have had a number of meetings with them. Uh, they are, let me put this politely, uh, they see us as an inconvenience, you and I. They see the communities surrounding the airport as an inconvenience. And they are less than responsive and less than respectful uh, to the people who they should be serving. So uh, to the point where they will not even come in, I asked them to come in, Mike Capuano and I asked them to come in to Milton and, and have a sit down with our neighbors. And uh, they have refused to do so. So that's, that's a pretty basic thing that, that a government agent should be, should be doing, is coming in and talking to the people that are impacted by its policies. So. It's bad. The relationship is bad. Uh, fortunately, we have the FAA Reauthorization Act coming up uh, in Congress, and we've got, uh, we've got a couple of measures there that we're, we're working on. Mike Capuano and I are part of the Quiet Skies Caucus. It's a group of members of the House and Senate that serve areas surrounding international airports in this country. And we're all having this problem because it's an FAA policy and they've, they've, they've angered and upset a lot of communities across the country. So we've got a couple of things here. Uh, one, one proposal would be to reduce the day-night average sound level, the DNL, uh, significantly, which over any one community would force them to spread out the impact of, of flights. It would, it would force them off their current, that, that laser beam where every single flight is coming over, you know, Milton and Dorchester and South Boston. Uh, it, would, it would require them to, to dissipate the, the noise. The other provision uh, is, a, is a, uh, a regulatory fix as well, and uh, it, would regard, uh, it, it would be regarding health standards and a bill directly the, the FAA to utilize existing resources such as required navigation performance systems to maximize their ability to reduce noise levels over uh, areas next to the airport heavily impacted areas. So uh, that's where we are right now. 
And, and, if, and if that doesn't work, then we're going to have to do something drastic, which would be perhaps form a multi-state, multi-city coalition uh, and, and bring legal action against the FAA because for health reasons, having all these planes going over you know, a very narrow cluster of communities is detrimental to the health of those communities over the long term. So we would need to get lawyered up. We would need to have, you know, we would need to do some health studies to, to justify our position, and then we'll have, to, we'll have to go at them. We'll really have to go at them hard. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a long-term strategy, too. So I don't want to have to go to that, you know, I don't want to have to go to the mattresses, as they say, on this thing. But I, I'd like to have a, you know, work an agreement out with them. But uh, based on their past uh, responses, I, I am not hopeful in that regard. Uh, another matter, this, I'll, I'll end with this probably. Well, I got a couple more things. We just went down, myself and uh, Congressman Capuano and, and Governor Baker went down and offered testimony before FEMA to try to get some more snow removal money, some mitigation money because of the winter that you all just went through. Uh, we argued, well, FEMA ruled that they would compensate us for the first snowstorm that lasted, according to them, I think 72 hours. But, but as I pointed out, and Mike and, and Governor Baker, we, we pointed out that this was a 29-day storm and, and, and it was 104 inches, and that during that during that 29 days, it did not go above freezing at any point, day or night. And so it's a weather pattern that has been compensated in the past in Buffalo, New York, where they, you know, they got, they got 200 inches. They, were, they prevailed a few years ago on this same theory that, that, uh, that the snow was a continual weather pattern and it was not just one storm. So, so we're, we're proceeding with that and uh, we're hopeful. They, they've expressed some flexibility but uh, we're still not where we, we need to be. And uh, so that, that fight goes on. Um, one of the great, in closing, one of the great honors I have is to appoint uh, young men and women to the uh, military academies of this country. And uh, Milton has, has overperformed in, in that regard uh, since I have been a member of Congress. I just want to recognize uh, uh, several young men uh, from Milton. Uh, Thomas Biesinger. Uh, 30 Gordon Road, Milton, Massachusetts. Uh, graduate of Milton High School. His parents are Ed and Janet. He's I just appointed him uh, and he has been accepted. They get themselves to the two yard line and I just shove them over. So it's, it's mostly these young men and women that, that do it all. I just give them the nomination when they get to the, but it takes a heck of a lot of work on their part and their family's part and their community's part and their high school's part and their coach's part to get them to that point, and then I get to take all the credit. Uh, but he is expected to report uh, to West Point on July 1st, 2015. He's probably doing push-ups and set-ups as we speak, but... Uh, <laughs> also, Luke Glinsky, his parents are Ed Glinsky and Denise Keneally. He is currently at the U.S. Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs, Colorado. He is, uh, he is graduating this year, uh, but he's a graduate of uh, Boston College High School. And also uh, Griffiths Hiss, 273 Adams Street, Milton, also a graduate of Milton High School. It's a, it's a very competitive process. You know, you see the resumes of some of these young men and women, it's incredible. But uh, graduate of Milton High School, his parents are Robert and Mary, uh, he also, uh, is, uh, is attending the U.S. Air Force Academy, and uh, he is of the class of 2016. And so I keep an eye on, on our, our kids when they, when they get accepted, and uh, I know that the two, well, one is, a, you know, as I said, uh, uh, Tom is, Thomas is actually gonna report in July, but the other two uh, are at on near the top of their class and doing a fantastic job and the town of Milton has every reason to be extremely proud of these young men. So, uh,
I know Brian's looking at his watch. I've gone way over. Uh, let me just thank you for your courtesy, uh, for allowing me to, to give this brief report. Uh, thank you very much for serving in, in town meeting. That's a very important uh, part of our, our democracy. Uh, God bless the town of Milton, and God bless these United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. All right, members, we're back to Article 8, which you will find at the bottom of page 31. Article 8, to see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for the purpose of funding cost items not in departmental budgets for the 12-month period beginning July 1, 2015, for collective bargaining agreements reached before or after town meeting between the town and the bargaining units representing town employees. Such sums to be allocated to departments and to act on anything related thereto. It is submitted by the Board of Selectmen and it is recommended the town appropriate the sum of $391,917 and that to meet said appropriation the sum of $189,205 be raised from the tax levy and the sum of $202,712 be raised from funds certified by the Department of Revenue as free cash. This will require a majority vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion carries. Article 9, to see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for the 12-month period beginning July 1, 2015, for the several categories classified as employee benefits and to act on anything related thereto and it is recommended the town appropriate the amounts shown in the following tabulation under the heading recommended. Employee benefits. Contributory retirement recommended at FY16, $5,257,278. Group insurance recommended at FY16, $10,534,759. Total employee benefits recommended at FY16, of $15,792,037. And to meet said appropriation, the sum of $15,792,037 be raised from the tax levy. This will require a majority vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Yes, sir, you're recognized. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ted Daver, uh, Precinct 5. Uh, I guess what I have is a question. I'm not sure the best person to address it to. Oh, well, I'll help you find that. Just okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's two parts to this article. One is the contributory ret requ retirement contribution, and the other is group insurance. The, the comment seems to address the contributory retirement contribution and, and notes that um, I guess it's maybe three-quarters of it is being allocated to the unfunded actuarial liability, and it gives figures from the uh, actuarial report indicating that the um, unfunded liability as of January 1, 2013 was almost $35 million, having increased in, in two years from about $25.6 million. It doesn't deal with the group insurance part of it, and I guess that's where my question uh, is directed. I, I pulled a copy of the actuarial report off of the internet, and the actuarial report also has tables uh, that deal with other post-employment benefits. I, I realize that there is an article later on in the warrant uh, that deals with uh, the establishment of a um, liability trust fund and allocates, I think, 516000 or would allocate $516,000 to it. But um, the, the, the table that's in the uh, actuarial report shows required um, annual contributions to um, other post-employment benefits, which over the last six years have ranged from $9 million to $12 million, 
and shows the town having made actual contributions of a little more than a third of that every year. So I, I guess my question is, out of this, first question would be, out of this $10 million, $10.5 million that's uh, recommended to go into group, group insurance, because other post-employment benefits is largely health insurance, as I understand it, is any portion of that going to try to bring down the unfunded liability, which a note in Article 36 uh, states is $92.8 million now, which is a pretty large sum for the town. That's unfunded liability. Uh, is any portion of the, of the um, $10 million going to bring that down? And um, you know, if not, uh, is there some kind of a plan to bring down that portion of the um, unfunded liability for other post-employment benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tabor. Mr. Hayes, do you wish to be recognized? Do we see you? Uh... Thank you. Mr. Hayes, you're recognized. Okay, I might need a little assistance here, but. Um, Basically, the ten thousand, the ten million five hundred and thirty-four thousand, is an annual. Uh, you, you might think of it as a the premium cost for the health insurance of active employees. Um, the the Article Thirty Six, the other other post-employment benefits uh, trust fund, is is for retirees' health cost, um, and. The unfunded liability is because everybody who's working now eventually will retire and qualify for those benefits, and we can't let them go on uh, go on forever unfunded. So, several years ago, um, the General Accounting Standards Board, the <laughs> Government Accounting Standards Board. <laughs> uh, came out with a Regulation 45 that re required people start recognizing this unfunded liability um, and, and uh, re recommended that they start doing something about it. So this is what we're trying to do with, with uh, the, the article down the road. Uh, as, far as, as far as how many people are, that are currently retired being uh, covered by the premium in this article, I'm not really sure, and I think maybe somebody else could speak to that. Mr. Hurley, you're recognized Thanks. for the purpose of addressing the member's question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Tom Hurley, Chairman of Board of Selectmen, uh, Tom Meeting Member Precinct 5. Uh, the, the $10 million number that you see for health insurance includes both uh, active employees and retired employees. Uh, but it does not include uh, school retired employees who are part of the, I believe, part of the group insurance, uh, state group insurance. Uh, so, so it does not include all retired employees. Um, but, but it does include some. I, I, I have no idea how much of that contribution because we really, we're for the most part self-insured. We have a stop loss policy, but, um, but that's going into a trust fund. That $10 million goes into a trust fund to pay our self-insured um, as well as the premium uh, that we have on that stop loss policy. So it's difficult to tell exactly how much of that goes to what group of people. Um, but I can also tell you that when you look at the actuarial report for uh, the um, uh, OPEB or other um, post employment benefits, uh, a lot of the contribution that you see is the pay as you go contribution, which would be part of that $10 million. Uh, it doesn't really fund the, um, the liability because it's money basically going in and out. It's technically a contribution that's theoretically then paid right back out again to the retirees. So, so it really doesn't go any place in terms of, of funding a trust and building up a fund. Thank you. Mr. Dave, are you comfortable? I suspect, Mr. Dave, when we get to Article 36, you can probably pursue some of that question more at that point. Thank you. Okay, uh, does anyone else wish to speak to this recommendation? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion carries. Article 9, excuse me, Article 10, which you'll find on the, on the bottom of page uh, 33. To see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate to reimburse the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Division of Employment Security for benefits paid to former employees of the town and to act on anything related thereto. It is recommended the town appropriate the sum of $100,000 for the purpose set forth in this article and that to meet said appropriation, the sum of $100,000 be raised from the tax levy. This will require a majority vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 11. I want to make some comments here um, before we go too deep in this. You will see that Article 11, as it does in every annual town meeting for many, many years, covers a long table of uh, job classifications by department, et cetera. And then you will see there's a recommendation to fund certain portions. I, uh, you will also find that there's an explanation, in the explanation it talks about the change in the funding in comments on page 39. So in other words, you will find on page 39 in the comments really the focus of what's happening in this article. I wanted to point that out because I plan to go directly to page 38 and read you the recommendation of the Warren Committee. So on the bottom of page 38, it is recommended the town vote to amend chapter 13 of the general bylaws known as the personnel administration bylaw exactly as set forth in this schedule and to appropriate the sum of $28,681 to fund wage adjustments effective July 1st, 2015, said sum to be added to the salary accounts of the departments as shown in the following tabulations. Central Business Office, recommended FY16 of $2,249, Consolidated Facilities, $2,171, Council on Aging, $1,047, Fire, $2,836, Library, $1,398, Personnel, $702, Police, $11,311, Public Works, General, $507, Vehicle Maintenance Public Works, $94, Solid Waste General under Public Works, $38 for a total Public Works of $639. Selectmen, $5,653, Town Clerk Salary Other, $239, Veterans Agent, $300, Warren Committee, $136, Total Chapter 13 Wage Adjustments, $26,000. $681, and that to meet said appropriation, the sum of $28,681 be raised from the tax levy. This will require a majority vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. Motion carries. Article 12. To see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for the 12 month period beginning July 1st, 2015, for the several categories classified as public safety, and to act on anything related thereto. It is recommended the town appropriate the amount shown in the following tabulation under the heading recomm recommended Public Safety, Inspectional Services, Salary and Wages, recommended FY16 of $406,900, General Expenses. $17,273 for a total inspectional services FY16 recommendation of $424,173. Fire, salary and wages $4,590,764. General expenses $228,267. Capital outlay $57,526 for a total fire recommended FY16 of $4,876,557. Milton, a management emergency agency, MEMA. Salary and wages, recommended FY16 of $750. General expenses, $785.
Auxiliary Fire, $4,380. Auxiliary Police, $4,700. For a total MEMER, recommended FY16, $10,615. Police and Youth, salary and wages, $6,141,264. General expenses, $492,620. Leash law, $81,248. New equipment, $124,524. For a total police and youth of $6,839,656. Total public safety, recommended FY16, of $12,151,001. In and to meet said appropriation for leash law enforcement, the sum of $1,400 be transferred from dog licenses surcharge account received pursuant to Chapter 197 of the Acts of 1981, and the sum of $10,520 be raised from the funds certified by the Department of Revenue as free cash. The balance of $12,139,081 is to be raised in the tax levy of the fiscal year. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Yes, sir, you're recognized. Thank you. Tom Kelly, Precinct 8. Um, I have a question in the fire department uh, budget scenario here. It seems like in Article 11, which we just passed, there's, it looks like a promotion for a fire prevention officer to F2. And then later on in that same article, on page 40, it talks about that the personnel board is uh, asking for creation of a lieutenant position and the fire department. So that is part of Article 11, which passed. Now in Article 12, which in the comments section on page 41, it talks about cuts uh, in, in pay, uh, cuts in, in budgets, and it mentions the fire department, 208,814, reduction from its level service requests and it's also a personnel salary, which includes the loss of a new required training officer at Lieutenant Gray. So what does it all mean? Somebody says they put it in and somebody else says we're not gonna fund it. Is that what it means? Uh, does this position exist or not exist? Yeah. Mr. Hayes, you recognize the purpose of addressing the question? Thank you. The um, Article 11 is uh, the article submitted annually by the Personnel Board, and it reflects their approval or of, of a new lieutenancy for the fire department. It doesn't reflect that we were able to fund that position. It's, it's, uh, it just says that they created it it's allowable on the books if we choose to fund it. We could not fund it. So it's been created but not funded. Same as the, uh, um, the creation, the same, same as for the creation of the two uh, police officers. The, the positions have been created uh, by the personnel board. They're on the roster, but we cannot fund them. So Mr. Hayes, would it, so, would it, would it be correct to assume that, that uh, that the personnel board was one of them created, and perhaps a future town meeting could, in fact, fund them. Or it doesn't completely answer my question in this regard. There seems to be a promotion to a fire training officer and an additional lieutenant. What was funded and what was not funded? Those are the same positions. Okay. Uh, the, it doesn't seem to be that way, but. Well, I'll take your word for it. I guarantee you, we, we did not hire a new lieutenant uh, in, for training purposes or even for not, not for training purposes in the fire department. No, but there would have been an incremental increase which could show up in the number that you have, additional, uh, an incremental increase to a lieutenant from a staff person presently existing, which would not be a new candidate. It could be read that way. Could be. I'm sorry for the confusion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, you're recognized. I'll test the mic. Bob Hiss, Precinct 3. I had the same question, so thank you for that. A question on police. 
So if I take it, there were no increase in officers in the salary and wage line. So if I did the math, it comes to 5.6%. So the, the, if there's no change in officers, then my question is, uh, I think a year ago, we didn't include the increase in fiscal 15. We had a separate article because there were some negotiations going on. So is this 5.6%? You know, two years, the catch up from last year and this year, or is it just this one year? It's the two years. Okay, thanks. So, for those that didn't catch that, apparently the chairman of the Warren Committee indicated yes, it was two years. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Yes, Ms. Agostino, you're recognized. Diane DeTulio, Agostino, Precinct 9. Um, first of all, I'd just like to make a comment that with the incredible winter we had, the police and the fire departments were phenomenal to go out and do what they had to do, get it done, and for the safety of everybody. <laughs> Especially when it came to the back-breaking work of shoveling out fire hydrants, and that's my question. Um, I'm not sure if it actually would come under this budget, because I don't think it's a capital item, but I had discussions, and I forgot to ask the chief where it finally ended up in the budget, as far as having the markers on the fire hydrants that you might recall were available years ago. So if, the, um, if it's under this budget or if it's a different one, wherever you can find it, Mr. Moderator, I'd really like to know that the fire hydrants uh, for next year's storms will be clearly visible for everybody's safety. So, so essentially you're wondering, where are the markers for the fire hydrants and, and are they funded for next year? Right. Thank you. Who do we have here? Oh, I see our fire chief making his way down to the purpose of addressing the question. Chief Grant, pick any microphone, and you are recognized. What we're going to do, we are going to get those hydrants marked. Uh, it's going to take place over two budget cycles. Uh, we've looked at the new equipment funds, which were actually already in and, and accepted uh, for this coming fiscal year. Uh, but I looked at, at this year and next year, uh, and we were able to streamline some of the purchases and put out some of the purchases a little bit further. Uh, so between the two years, we'll, we'll be able to put together enough money out of the general expense line to get that done. Uh, so as we come into the end of this year, uh, in June, we'll purchase some, and then getting into July, we'll purchase the rest and get those uh, installed before next winter. Thank you, Chief. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Required a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion of the Warren Committee say aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 13. To see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for the payment of legally obligated medical expenses incurred from July 1st, 2015 through July to, through June 30th, 2016 for the town's public safety personnel resulting from injuries sustained in the line of duty and to determine how said appropriation be raised, whether by transfer from available funds, borrowing under applicable provisions of law, or otherwise to act on anything related there too. It's submitted by the Board of Selectmen, and you will note that in your packet you have a revised recommendation, and thank you for the Warren Committee trying to signal me before I get out of control. Um, does anyone, uh, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen or the Warren Committee want to explain the reason for the change, the revised recommendation? Mr. Hurley, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Tom Hurley, Chairman, Board of Selectmen. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the change in this article is because of the passage of uh, the, uh, the override, question one override vote um, uh, to fund the medical expenses uh, through another means. So that was, so we were able to uh, basically take the money from this article um, and it was, I can let Ted explain where it was redistributed in the budget, but it was redistributed. Um, but while I'm up, I, I'd just also like to thank, that the, uh, in terms of question one, it was, it, it was an override vote that really had no natural con uh, constituency. Um, so, you know, we did become concerned that of uh, just kind of getting the message out. Uh, and I'd just like to recognize 
the, the few volunteers we had working on this ballot question uh, for all the hard work they did uh, in trying to get the word out. And that was uh, Malcolm Larson, Steve Moresh, Joseph Patrick O'Malley, John Shields, uh, Anne-Marie Fagan, Katie Conlon, uh, so that's quite an array of people. Uh, and also we had uh, volunteers that helped pass out, uh, distribute leaflets throughout the town. That was uh, Jane Boylan, Jim McGolliffe, Mary McGetrick, Bill Mullen, and uh, Anita uh, Penta. So I'd just like to thank those people. Thank you. The recommendation that you'll be voting on for Article 13 is recommended that no, that recommended that the town vote no appropriation for the purpose of this article. Does anyone wish to speak to this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 14. Article 14 is to see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate for the 12-month period beginning July 1, 2015, for the operation of the town departments classified as general government and to act on anything related thereto. And it is recommended the town appropriate the amount shown in the following, tab following tabulation under the heading recommended. And I will, as has been my practice, read you just the recommended FY16 amounts. Under Board of Selectmen, Central Business Office, salaries and wages, Recommended FY16 of $298,921, general expenses of $5,771, for a total central business office of $304,692. Election and registration, salary and wages, $29,250, general expenses, $25,850, for a total election and, and registration, recommended FY16 of $55,100, insurance general, general expenses, Recommended FY16 of $950,703 for a total insurance general of $950,703. Law, retainer, $58,000. Professional and special services, $197,000. Dis disbursements, $5,000. Claims, $1,000. For a total law, recommended FY16 of $261,000. Information technology, salary and wages, $135,530, general expenses $326,273, total information technology recommended FY16 of $461,803. Annual reports, general expenses town reports, recommended FY16 of $6,300, general expenses warrant $0, total annual reports $6,300. Selectman, salary chairman $1,800, Salary other members, $3,000. Salary town administrator, $156,969. Salary other, $331,339. General expenses, $26,577. For a total selectman, FY16 of $519,685. Veterans benefits, salary and wages of $19,975. General expenses, $1,785. Benefits, $120,020. Total veterans benefits, recommended FY16 of $141,780. Total board of selectmen, recommended FY16 of $2,701,063. Board of assessors, salary chairman, $1,800. Salary other members, $3,000. Salary other, $215,249. General expenses, $25,753. Revaluation of $115,000 for a total Board of Assessors FY16 of $358,802. Town Clerk, Salary Clerk, $90,316. Salary Others, $129,482. General Expenses, $45,070. Total Town Clerk of $264,868. Treasurer Collector, Salary Treasurer, $91,316. Salary other, $203,804. General expenses of $85,370. For total treasurer collector recommended FY16 of $380,490. Total general government recommended FY16 of $3,705,223. And that's to meet said appropriation, a sum of $3,668,185 be raised from the tax levy in the sum of $136,555 be raised from funds certified by the Department of Revenue as free cash 
and the sum of $40,000 be transferred from Article 14 of the May 2014 Annual Town Meeting Selectman General Expenses. This will require a majority vote. Yes, sir. Mr. Howe, you're recognized. Richard Howe, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 3. Uh, could I please have uh, some clarification on the reason for the uh, $100,000 increase under information technology for general expenses? So Mr. Howe is, is speaking to the increase you will find toward the top of page 43 of 100, roughly, no, exactly, almost exactly $100,000 to information technology general expenses. Mr. Hayes, you're recognized for the purpose of addressing the question. Thanks. I don't know if Jim Segroy is here or not, but um, the, of that hundred uh, increase, most of it is in contracts for software hosting and maintenance. The last 40000 is a is an overlap cost for, uh, for the costs of um, hosting and ma maintaining the new so financial software system the town is purchasing. So that's 40 of it. Also this year, uh, some of that cost is from has been transferred from the library to IT for for maintaining the servers that w previously had been maintained at the library. Now that's being centralized to the IT department. Um, and in general, we are now trying to uh, protect uh, contracts with outside vendors from from the squeeze of of leveling budgets. So so that um, We've, we've now been able to identify those costs from year to year, and unfortunately, those go up. Um, but that is, those are, that's the broad outline of, what's, of what accounts for that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Ms. Todd, do you wish to be recognized? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recognition of the Warren Committee say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Unanimous. Article 15. Oh boy. <laughs> you may have noticed that Article 15 goes on for many pages, and I'm talking strictly the recommendation. It is uh, submitted by the Board of Selectmen and the Town Government Study Committee. When I reach an article such as this with its recommendation, I have a dilemma. I know that some are just tired of listening to me read on and on, and an article that goes four pages seems like he's reading on and on. At the same time, it's, a, it's an important uh, motion before the body. Uh, if anyone is interested, I would entertain a motion to, to pass on the reading. Otherwise, I'm ready to get right into it. It's been moved. It's, an, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to pass on the reading, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you. Thank you for the yes, and thank you for the vote of confidence with the no. Okay. So this is submitted by the Town Government Study Committee. Mr. Neely, do you wish to be recognized to explain what we have in front of us? Mr. Neely, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rick Neely, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 3, Chairman of the Town Government Study Committee. This article is a result of several years of work that the committee has had looking at the role of the town administrator and the board of selectmen, and we also engaged the services of the Department of Revenue to assist in reviewing the town government, and this was also looked at by them, and in fact, uh, this topic was one of their first recommendations. And it's based upon the fact that we find that many of our peer communities have evolved over a period of years to strong town administrators. So if you go back to 1985, only about 24 towns had town administrators. By 2005, we're up to 138 towns with town administrators. So the town government has evolved over a period of years from essentially, in the old days, it was the Board of Selectmen that used to do the management of the town. Uh, Dan Duggan was well known for running the business in the town. Uh, these days, what's happened is that the complexity of the business is so great and the issues are so great and the responsibilities are so great that it's easy for the Board of Selectmen to get bogged down in the operational detail and administrative detail. 
For example, even though the Board of Selectmen does not control the school committee or the library or many other elected boards, the Board of Selectmen is responsible for the appointment of over 100 positions. Now, that takes, obviously, a reliance upon your department heads, but it also takes a review and some work effort to do all that. They've also had many other responsibilities. And you can see those in the article that we just, uh, if you look through those letters from A to Z that we just uh, have chosen to keep in the warrant, but we didn't have to read, fortunately. The key point is that we believe, uh, and jointly we met with the Board of Selectmen, we've worked closely with the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Selectmen and the Town Government Study Committee are in agreement that there needs to be a delegation of authority to the town administrator. A greater amount of authority should be delegated, and it should be outlined in a formal process. Right now, over the last 20 years, there's been a great turnover in the Board of Selectmen. I was one of them over in the last 20 years. There is an unevenness in the application and the delegation of authority from term to term to term. This formalizes what should be delegated and outlines a process in a way for the Board of Selectmen to be able to follow, and it outlines that, in fact, the operational management should be under the control of the town administrator. It articulates in 2M and 2N, if you would look at that right now, if you would turn to your warrant and look at 2M and 2N, it outlines important responsibilities with regard to financial planning and financial management that we would like to see the town administrator take a lead on and that be formally articulated in this article, which regards to talk about the five-year plan. It talks about strategic planning, and we're asking for the town administrator to provide that to the Board of Selectmen. So 2M talks about the formulation of long-range and annual financial plans, including detailed projections of revenues and expenditures, and to prepare and to present to the Board of Selectmen and the Warren Committee an annual operating budget and to prepare and present to the Capital Improvement Committee and the Board of Selectmen a proposed capital budget for the town for five years. The next one gets into recommendations with respect to departmental and non-departmental expenditures, all of which we think should be a part of a regular process that's articulated and is not contingent upon each year, depending on who is in the Board of Selectmen. So we have a situation where we've come up with a major recommendation for you. We've outlined this. We've kept it to the departments within the Board of Selectmen. We have not changed anything with regard to the school committee or the library board or the other elected boards. This strictly deals with the entities that report to the Board of Selectmen. So there, again, there are no other elected boards directly affected. Certainly there is an expectation the town administrator will coordinate and work closely with all of the other elected boards and their appointed directors. I think the key thing here is that the town has grown so much, we need to get to a situation where we need to have a strengthened administrator. We need a stronger role, and that would allow the Board of Selectmen to get into the policy issues and strategic issues and strategic planning that it gets diverted from and has been over the period of years. So with the Board of Selectmen, we recommend this article for your adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Scott Matthews, um, Town Meeting Manor, Precinct uh, 4. Uh, I want to make a motion to amend this article. Uh, if we look in Section 5, the second paragraph, it talks about an event that the town administrator is unable to perform the duties that the Board of Selectmen may appoint in writing a qualified town officer, whereas in the first paragraph, it just says that um, the Board of Selectmen shall appoint an interim town administrator. So, um, sir, just to, just to help us to clear, first of all, yeah, he's speaking to Section 5, which you'll find on page, the bottom 49. Of page 49. Yes. And specifically, there are two paragraphs in that section. Which, which is it that you're recommending we change? I'm recommending a change to the first paragraph. Okay. Um, due to it looks like a disparity in terms of the second paragraph talks about appointing a qualified town officer as an interim, um, as a town administrator, but the first paragraph, which I'd like to change, just says appointing an interim town administrator. So, so uh, sir, if I may, can, 
Can I suggest you pose that as a question if, if there is a reason for that, and then perhaps you might want to make a recommendation? Sure. Okay. Is, is there a reason for the difference? Thank in you. <laughs> um, Where is Mr. Naley? There he is. Mr. Hurley, did you want to address it? You know, you know, Mr. Neely, before you make your remarks, could I ask everybody in the hall that's part of the Town Government Study Committee to please stand so the people, the membership can understand the, the folks and the experience that went into all these discussions. I would suggest to you that the amount of experience uh, and intellect in that committee is pretty extensive. Mr. Neely, you're recognized for the purpose of addressing the question. Well, Mr. Martyr, if I understand the question correctly, it is, on this first paragraph, the intention here is for a temporary person to fill that position. And for example, it could be an assistant town administrator, for example. So the, really the intention was for a short-term vacancy and again the thought process is for example there is an assistant town administrator and the board of selectmen could appoint that assistant town administrator to fill that role so I hope does that answer your question um, it answers my question in terms of why it was put there but my concern is that this article is extending a lot more responsibility and power to the town administrator so if you're going to the point in the second paragraph saying that this person should be a qualified person to fill this role, that I would think that in the first paragraph when we're talking about that, of selecting an interim person, that you would want a qualified person to fill that role, and not just someone that you pick out of the staffing to fill it temporarily. Ms. Daly, if you, if you would hold on for one minute. It's, uh, just, excuse me. I think I might have a... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let me just uh, clarify the, in, the intent here. In the first paragraph of that section, the intention is that the appointing process would follow the qualifications that are outlined earlier in this article. So if you go back to the article, it talks about the qualifications required for a person to become the town administrator. So the intention, for example, is if you would follow that appointment process and meet the qualifications that are outlined in this article. The second one is, and let me just correct myself, the second paragraph deals with a situation where in a short-term illness situation, the Board of Selectmen would have the authority to determine what is qualified. So the Board of Selectmen would make the distinction and not have to follow the outline of this article. So if someone suddenly had a heart attack and need to be replaced, the Board of Selectmen might choose a person in town government that they believe is qualified for that short-term period. I misspoke when I first said that the first section dealt with temporary. It's really the second section deals with temporary. 
And the first one, again, the first section is if the town administrator left and you were to appoint an interim town administrator, that interim town administrator would need to follow the qualifications that are outlined at the beginning of this article. That was the distinction. So, so Mr. Neely, let, let me take a, a, a shot at this. The first paragraph you're talking about is, is filling a vacancy, which could be for an extended period of time, would follow all the, all the qualifications of the position. The second paragraph is really just a temporary appointment uh, to cover a shorter period of time. Is that correct? Mr. Hurley says that's correct. So, before, before, did, you, did you want to add something, Mr. Neely? No, we're both said, Mr. Okay. Sir, are you satisfied with that explanation, or do you, did you have a follow-up? I, I had a follow-up. So, I, I would be satisfied with that estimation, except for the fact that it says that this person is to be appointed for a period not longer than 12 months, which implies a temporary time period. And 12 months so be I, before 14 days. Before 14 well, days, be, be, but as opposed to 14 days, is opponent, but not for a period longer. So you're saying that's not reading that they're not they're going to be appointed for no longer than no, let me, a Mr. year. Mr. If Mr. I could, Mr. Moderator, uh, the first paragraph we stuck the limitation of 12 months in, so that the board of selectmen would not have an indefinite interim town administrator. So the intention was to require the Board of Selectmen to complete the process and to select the town administrator, not to have an interim that is interim for five years. So then that still goes back to what I was saying before, that this person is in... The qualification, again, the first... I guess it, it's, not, it's not very clear to me that when you're saying it's an interim person, right, that can be... It, it sounds like you're saying that this person has to be hired and go through the qualification process but then it also sounds like you're saying that this is an interim person until they pick somebody, that this person should be qualified, but by not putting in qualified and saying that they are interim makes it a little confusing that it doesn't exactly state to me that they're going through that whole process. As opposed to putting in the, the wordage that it's saying that this must be a qualified person to meet this role. So. So, sir, we may be at an impasse. Um, I, I, Ms. Neely, am I correct in assuming that you feel the current verbiage in both those paragraphs is adequate and appropriate? And if so, then the member, if you, if you are still uncomfortable, would have to make a motion to amend. Yeah. Mr. Moderator, we, we believe that if you, go, if you go back to page 45, which is to be section 1, in section one, about ten line, eight lines down, it de describes the town administrator shall be a person qualified by education, training, and previous experience to perform the duties set forth herein. We believe, you know, we, our expectation is that section five, paragraph one, would have to meet that requirement. Section two of that section two, the second paragraph of section five, would not be held to the same standard the town could end up choosing an existing department head, for example. Let's say uh, they chose the fire chief or the police chief or the DPW director or the assistant director, or excuse me, or the assistant town administrator under the second paragraph. That's the distinction. Mr. Hurley, you recognized? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Hurley, uh, Chairman of Board of Selectmen. I, I think if you, if you read the last sentence of uh, the first paragraph of Section 5, where it says uh, that the, uh, the, board, um, the Board of Selectmen uh, may at its discretion waive one or more of the requirements of the provision of Section 1, get you back to Section 1, that we would first have to look at Section 1 and identify a candidate that meets as many of those conditions as possible. That recognizing that there is a possibility that because you do have to appoint a town administrator in you know an interim town administrator should there be a vacancy in that position and you want to be able to appoint that relatively quickly so that you don't disrupt the entire town government so 
the inference of that last sentence is that you would look to section one for all of those qualifications first. And if there are one, if there's one of those qualifications you just can't meet, we do, we would have the power to waive one or more of those qualifications. But certainly the inference is there that section one should be complied with. Thank you. Town Council, Mr. Flynn, you recognized? Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, uh, part of the difference between the two paragraphs in section five is that the first paragraph is intended to address a vacancy. In other words, there is no town administrator at that time, either through death or resignation or whatever, uh, termination, whatever reason. In that circumstance, it's common or it, it's frequent to have a town in a situation where they want to fill the position, but the process to get a fully qualified candidate may take a while. For example, in several communities, what they do in the interim is appoint a retired town administrator who may have served for several years. That person may be fully qualified, but for example, may not be able to work the 200 hours a week that the town administrator normally works, but is otherwise qualified. So the Board of Selectmen, I think part of the reason for the language in Section 1 is, on an interim basis for a period not to exceed 12 months, the selectmen, to the best of their ability, would fill that, fill that position with an interim appointment that met the qualifications as much as they could. But again, it's, it's not uncommon to have an interim who is qualified by reason of experience, but may not to be able to be available full time. That's why it's called interim, because the process sometimes takes a while. Depending on the market out there, it might take a few months to get a candidate that the selectmen are comfortable appointing. The second situation does not, I'm sorry, the second paragraph in section five is not dealing with a vacancy. It's dealing with a situation where you have a town administrator, but for some reason that town administrator is not able to perform the duties of the office. It could be because of illness, injury, a death in the family, a sick spouse, a sick child, whatever. But it's meant to be a temporary situation only, and that's why, but on the other hand, uh, for at least 14 days. I mean, it could be it's a very short-term thing, and particularly where you have a deputy, the selectmen could, in their judgment, feel the position could be filled for a short-term period. But if it's 14 days or more, remember the position is not vacant, but you need someone to fill that position. I think the intent of the committee was, in that situation, the selectmen could appoint a qualified town officer, a deputy if you have one now, or some other point, but that's fairly common in municipal government. I hope that clarifies what the distinction is between the two paragraphs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. So, sir, let me, let me sort of summarize, I think, where we are. Uh, we've heard from the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, the chairman of the Town Government Study Committee that submitted the article, and our town council essentially say they believe that the verbiage is, is uh, appropriate in, in enough as is. You have caused a lot of illumination on this, and I suspect as a result have provided a lot of clarity for this town meeting over these two th positions, or these two explanations of the position. It, is it your intent to make a motion to amend? Otherwise, I believe that it's, it's best that we move on. Um, I, I would like to make a motion to amend, and oh. you know, town meeting can shoot it down if okay. they feel um, they or well, they could shoot it up. So that's actually a bad expression. My motion to amend is to basically change.